Um, I'm about to hand it over anyway to Eric and John to share more about what they do and their presentations today. Thanks so much, John and Eric, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Autumn. Uh, I'm John Meyer. I'm, the, like Autumn said, the assistant field manager here at the Wenatchee Field Office, Spokane District Beyond. I have about 20 years of uh, federal service with the Forest Service and, and the Bureau of Land Management, as well as a, a background educational in um, regional planning and community development. And um, one of the districts I worked on for the Forest Service was one that was heavily impacted by wild, by numerous large wildfires. So I had the opportunity to work in that environment in the post wildfire and recovery environment uh, for, for many years, uh, trying to you know navigate that uh, post fire world. So it's a little bit more on me and I'll turn it over to Eric. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, John and I are excited to be here and excited to be presenting together about um, this topic. I'm a, I'm a research social scientist with the U.S. Forest Service, and as Autumn said, I'm in the Pacific Northwest Research Station. Uh, I do a, a wide variety of research. About half my time is spent in uh, re recreation-related re research, largely around economics and measuring recreation use, uh, but I also do uh, some work in fire and fuels management, as well as some uh, timber management. But Happy to talk to, with you today about uh, recreating and relating to the land after fire. Uh, we thought we'd start off today with some take home messages uh, to get us going. And, and one of the real ones that John and I talked about a lot in advance is, is making sure we note that recreationists continue to be interested in visiting burned areas. Uh, they want to go there. And when they when they do visit those places, they're they're actually fairly satisfied with their recreation experience. Beyond uh, just providing recreation opportunity in burned areas, um, providing access and allowing people back in there to recreate can actually be part of the healing process, uh, trying to think a little bit about, um, about how can we help people heal after wildfire when the places that they care about um, are burned and, and recreation and being in those locations can be part of that recovery process. Sadness is a, is a normal and common part of uh, people's reactions to wildfire in places that they care about. Uh, but people also, beyond that sadness, recognize that, that that's a dynamic uh, situation and that there's vegetation regrowth. And they oftentimes, when they visit places, see, um, see a new beginning and, and recognize that, that this is the beginning of a process again. And then finally, as, as managers providing opportunities uh, to, to visit, to volunteer, to participate in planning, uh, that's one of uh, a real thing that you can do to help people heal, uh, res residents and recreationists. I'm gonna start off today just talking a little bit about recreation at a really high level. Um, and, and when we're thinking about how people react to fire and react to post-fire landscapes, I think it's helpful to, to think about why people are recreating. Uh, this is from data collected across the country uh, and reported by the Outdoor Industry Association. And, and if we look at sort of the top reasons that people are recreating, uh, this is percent of participants reporting this as a key reason to recreate. Uh, exercising, keeping fit, being with friends, uh, those are those are really key reasons that people are recreating. So uh, they're out there uh, in part to have experiences with their friends and, and to, to be physically active. If we look at things like observing scenic beauty or, or being close to nature or nature-based uh, motivations, those are in there as well, uh, but they're reported by, by less participants. And so the motivation oftentimes is to get out there and, and spend some time with friends and family or just to to get out and blow off some stress. And if you think about your own recreation, I suspect that resonates with you. Looking across the country at uh, recreation participation, um, these, these figures are a little old in this graph now. Uh, the Outdoor Industry, Outdoor Foundation has changed how they do their reporting. So, um, but the basic principles still, still remain here. A little more than half of the US population engages in outdoor recreation across the country. And that came up a little bit during uh, the early years of the coronavirus pandemic. And so we're, we're somewhere in the area of 54, 55% of the population engaging in recreation activity. Across the country, if you look at what sorts of activities people are doing, uh, hiking and camping are the leaders, uh, most common activities. 
And again, during the early coronavirus times, hiking in particular uh, took off. Uh, camping also increased during that time. And again, these are a little old, but this pattern still holds. Hiking and camping are the activities that people most commonly engage in, uh, in thinking about ways people interact with, with the types of resources we're used to managing. And then a whole suite of other recreation activities, such as backpacking or kayaking or mountain biking, uh, are done by, by less than 10% of the population. Those of you who live in Oregon and Washington, you know that we're probably more outdoor folk than those national averages. And so if we look just at our two states, 95% uh, of the residents of, of our two states say they participate in some form of outdoor recreation. And uh, almost uh, three-fourths of the population says they go walking on local trails and paths around their house. And that could be um, in the urban setting, that could be um, on nonprofit lands, or that could be on national forest system lands that are located near their home. And then about 50% of our residents in our two states report that they actually do go on day hikes uh, to uh, somewhere else away from their home. And so uh, that would be comparison to that level, that percentage, about 15% that I showed nationally. So the residents of Oregon and Washington are really engaged uh, in outdoor recreation and really connected to forest lands. You already knew that, knew that if you lived here. Narrowing in a little bit more uh, to look at National Forest Service, National Forest System lands specifically uh, here in Oregon and Washington. And, and so these are activities that um, the primary activities that people engage in on national forests in Oregon and Washington. And we see again that hiking and walk, hiking and walking is the most common uh, recreation activity on Forest Service lands, followed by downhill skiing and falling by viewing nature. And those three activities uh, account for about 55% of the visits to national forests in Oregon and Washington. That pattern of those three activities and the rest of the activities you see here, this is very consistent across the country, uh, hiking and walking and downhill skiing for those national forests that have ski areas are typically the most common activities on, on Forest Service lands. There's a whole other suite of recreation activities I'm not showing on this chart, but this gives you a sense about the magnitudes of what people are doing out on the landscape. And again, think about that, um, those types of activities when we're thinking about post-fire management. Moving to private lands, uh, across the country, about half of individual and family-owned forests uh, are used for recreation. And most of the people who are, have access to those uh, lands for recreation are the, are the families uh, themselves or maybe their friends, but, but usually the family itself, that's, those are the only ones who are recreating on those lands. And while they're commonly used for recreation, there's not much management on uh, family and individual forest lands for recreation or for wildlife habitat. So less than, uh, the less than maybe a quarter of those ownerships uh, are reported to be managed for recreation or wildlife habitat. If we look at forest industry lands, um, upwards somewhere nationally around upwards of 85% of forest industry lands are used for recreation. And a lot of that activity is centered around uh, hunting opportunities and wildlife habitat. All right, so transitioning a little bit into thinking about post-fire uh, and recreation. And, and when I think about wildfire and, and how it influences the landscape for recreation, I oftentimes think about it in, a, in two ways. First, um, burn landscapes alter recreation by, by creating environmental uh, or social conditions that change how we desire uh, our, our ability to recreate in that place. And then the second thing that, that fire may do is that it may cause damage to infrastructure uh, or create environmental conditions uh, such as unstable slopes, uh, likelihood of flash flooding that can result in site closures or management changes. And that alters our ability to recreate in those landscapes. And so I'm gonna use this framing to kind of go through a little bit of the science about post-fire recreation. And we'll start here with, with creating environmental or social conditions that change visitors' desires, our abilities. Interestingly, there's not a tremendous amount of research about wildfire and recreation and looking at specifically post-burn landscapes. A lot of the studies uh, that are out there 
are hypothetical in nature. And so they'll uh, conduct a survey or do focus groups or do interviews and present respondents with an image of a landscape that is burned and try to understand uh, maybe how many times or how that how that situation, how that burned landscape would change an individual's willingness to recreate there. And so they might show them this picture here and say, uh, if you saw this landscape, you know, how many times would you want to visit this in a given time? Or if this landscape burned, how would that change your interest in going to recreate here? And in general, these studies that look at hypothetical burn landscapes, they generally find that people say there's a reduced willingness to recreate in places that, that are burned or have the appearance of being recently burned, although that's not always the case. Sometimes people say they're more interested in recreating in those places. Uh, generally, there's a perception that recreating in, in that burned location uh, provides less benefit to the recreationists. They value recreating in that place less. These studies oftentimes find that a lower severity fire leads to smaller changes in recreation uh, behavior than high severity fires. So if they show them a, a, a landscape that appeared to have been burned in a high severity fire, people are less inclined to recreate there in general from these studies. And then regardless of whether or not recreation goes up or down immediately after fire, they generally uh, find that these trends in visitation will kind of go back to pre-fire levels over time. And that period over time could be uh, five years, 20 years, 40 years. There are uh, even fewer studies in actual burned landscapes. Uh, and, and here on the bottom are, are a few of are, are the majority of the studies that actually exist uh, here in North America on, on recreation and actual burned landscapes. And the results from those studies generally find that there's a loss in visitation um, after wildfire, but that loss is pretty short-lived and pretty modest. If we interview people who are recreating in burn landscapes, they generally uh, say that they view that, that condition as temporary. And oftentimes they think that it's somewhat novel. It's interesting to see and experience uh, the dynamic processes that happen post-fire. If you ask them how satisfied they are with their experience, the satisfaction levels that people report uh, after fire are generally pretty consistent with what they reported pre-fire. And then over time, um, we find this visitation return to the trend pattern to, to be pretty consistent across a wide range of fire severities uh, when we look at studies on site. And so here are just a uh, two of the studies that I have cited here that, that we have some graphs uh, to kind of look at visitation. And, and on the left side of your screen here is a study by Brown et al. Uh, down in Oregon um, in the, the Baron Booth fire, the B&B fires from 2003. And you don't need to figure out all of these lines. The primary thing you need to take away is that, that those lines stay pretty similar together. And so after the B&B fire, they looked at permits into the Mount Jefferson wilderness, both the burned and unburned portion of that wilderness. And they didn't find tremendous changes after the B&B &B fire. So visitation didn't dramatically dropped off in the burn area. Um, in fact, it stayed fairly similar. And they also didn't see a tremendous amount of movement of visitation into uh, the Mount Washington or the Three Sisters area. Uh, the authors in this study pointed out a fair amount that the, the response and recreation visits was actually much greater uh, in response to the fee demo program that came out in the late 90s. And so after the fee demo program, they could ac actually see quite a response in visitation loss uh, that, that wasn't anything like the response after the BNB fire. And the BNB fire uh, was, was um, high severity in, in many of the locations where people are recreating. So the setting was in a forested setting. And then on the right-hand side of your panel is uh, looking at um, recreation at the at the uh, Oregon, Park, Oregon State Parks site at the mouth of the Deschutes River after the substation fire in 2018. And this is in a uh, more of a high desert setting, a uh, few trees, but, but mostly high desert environment. And the substation fire happened on July 18th, if I'm remembering properly there. And that that fire happened, and then the interesting thing uh, here is that this, the recreation site reopened almost uh, immediately after confinement, after containment and uh, control. 
And so we were able to quickly look and see how rapidly recreation returned in the list landscape. And that dashed line is uh, recreation in year 2018. And, and you can see that it quickly returns back to the long 10-year ten, ten average uh, for both day use at the mouth of the river as well as camping. And, and the burned area came uh, right up to those campgrounds. And people on the day use side were actually recreating in the burned area. Uh, some recreation experiences in burned landscapes. So people are interested in seeing burned areas. That's pretty common. Uh, it can be an experiential opportunity, as I said. Um, there's a recognition that that this is a temporary condition uh, and it's a restart of a dynamic process. And then interestingly, in, in some studies, the Lorber one in particular, which take place at Multnomah Falls uh, two years after the Eagle Creek fire, um, sometimes visitors don't notice that there was a wildfire at all. Only two thirds of visitors in that study noticed uh, any signs of the Eagle Creek fire at Multnomah Falls. If we look at specific activities, we can see um, that there is some indication that different activities uh, groups respond differently to fire, but there isn't that many studies. Uh, there's some indication that, that people don't like to camp if you're doing backcountry activities in a burned area. So they don't mind walking through burned area, but they, they prefer not to have a campsite in the burned location in the backcountry. There's some indication that bikers um, may take fewer trips to burn landscapes than hikers. And then there's a couple of studies that identify that canoeists um, don't mind recreating in landscapes that have burned, but they might consider routes uh, and certainly campsites that are in the unburned portions of that landscape. But for the most part, we don't know a whole lot about how different activity groups respond. And then a lot of the findings are focused on um, on activities that, that can be done in a wide variety of places, such as hiking or camping or biking. There's, there's very little research looking at specific place-based recreation or foraging or subsistence activities, for instance. And uh, one study here that I've cited, Butler et al. 2021, they identify a couple of things that are important for managers. First, it, managers need to recognize the potential for conflict uh, as as uh, pre-fire foraging and subsistence activities may get shifted uh, to other locations and planning for that and, and coming up with responses to that is helpful. They also note in this article that partnering with the foragers and, and those using the landscape, landscape for subsistence can really promote continued connections to that landscape, even if, even if it's uh, burned in high severity conditions. And that's important to help uh, the healing process. Okay, burn landscapes can also uh, change um, conditions by, by damaging infrastructure and creating conditions in which uh, managers need to close recreation sites or make changes to their management. And I'm going to talk about one study that, that I've been involved with here uh, with my colleagues at University of Washington Outdoor R&D. And we are looking at the res response to recre the recreation response to the Eagle Creek fire, which happened here in the Columbia River Gorge where I live. And in 2017, that fire uh, burned in the area you see here in, in red on the screen. And a variety of recreation sites within that fire perimeter were closed for an extended period of time, multiple years. And then across the Columbia River Gorge, there were a wide variety of different substitute recreation site locations. Some uh, other recreation trails and um, and day use areas were open one year after the fire, those, those ones that are in green on the immediate periphery. And then the remainder of these sites in this map, all in purple, they were never closed. And so potentially uh, we had a situation where, where people who are not able to recreate in the Eagle Creek footprint, which was an incredibly popular uh, recreation area, we were wondering, um, did they go to other sites within the gorge? So were they displaced to other locations? And that's important for managers as we think about how people might respond. Uh, we also wonder what happened to recreation use in aggregate after this fire and with this long-term extended closure. And so my colleagues at the University of Washington and I were able to use some uh, statistical models and, and data from social media to 
to look at recreation use before the fire, which is marked by this dashed line on this on the screen, and then after the fire, and see how how they compared. Uh, and the the primary thing I want to note point out to you on this uh, graph is that we did this for a wide variety of sites. This is just a handful of sites in that map you looked at. And I want to point out the Larch Mountain uh, point on the top here, where it was on the periphery of the Eagle Creek fire and closed for about a year and then reopened uh, that following year. And we can see then that second year after the fire, uh, recreation use bounced back to, to where we would have expected at that site, just as an example of, of how that can happen. But if we look across all of these sites within the gorge and looked at the visitation that we uh, saw in the years after the fire and right before the fire, we wanted to examine what happened because of that closure uh, of the Eagle Creek fire perimeter. And so the Eagle Creek fire is in this dashed line in the middle. And then this is visitation in this whole landscape uh, to sites that were never closed in purple, sites that were closed for just one year in green, and then sites that were closed for two years in yellow. And if we look at that year right after the fire, uh, both the green and yellow sites are closed and all of that visitation got lost uh, to the area. This, this purple uh, set is just as high as it would we would have normally expected on the trend line. And all of this green and yellow visitation got lost uh, to the whole Columbia River Gorge area. Uh, when we opened those first round of sites back up, visitation came right back to them uh, right back to the level we would have expected. And so what we found in this study is that that closures of recreation sites, particularly if they're extended, can result in some real losses uh, in visitation. Uh, in this particular landscape, people, people just went to recreate somewhere other than the Columbia River Gorge, um, somewhere else in Oregon and Washington. I want to end my section with just a few management and planning considerations. Outfitters and guides are important for a lot of our provision of recreation uh, opportunity and, and experiences on public lands. And, and it's important to think about the challenges that outfitters and guides may face after fire. Uh, they're both dealing with changes in availability and quality of their recreation uh, destinations, as well as client perceptions, which could be inaccurate about, about the state of the situation. Um, and as a result, there could be a lot of booking and cancellations, and, and that has a real potential to cause revenue loss. As managers, it's to the extent to which we're able to offer outfitters and guides flexibility uh, in, in their offerings or how they're accessing resources, that may help mitigate uh, some of their immediate revenue losses. Uh, Post fire salvage, there, there is... Um, very little research on recreation and salvage. And so that's my first bullet there that we have a lot to learn about that. Uh, but just a couple of points. Um, my colleagues at University of Washington and I again have a paper that's getting ready to come out where we, we are looking at a variety of management actions and recreation. And we found a very small and modest positive response um, to salvage and recreation visits in the year after salvage. It's important that that may just be a reflection of sites reopening after salvage. So, so we should interpret that with a lot of caution. Uh, some other studies have found, if they ask potential recreationists about places where there are burned trees, uh, people have expressed maybe those sites are unsafe uh, for recreation and, and they might want to avoid them. And then another study uh, by Ryan and Hammond had found that residents uh, felt that once salvage had occurred in a location that, that that was safer for recreation. But there's a lot to learn about, about salvage. A little bit about grief and sadness. Um, it's common in the post-fire setting and as people think about landscapes. I remember my own self thinking about the Eagle Creek fire and that, that was a sad situation. Uh, even as someone who works in fire science, it, it was a sad situation and I felt sadness for that. But despite that, um, we still have interest, optimism, and curiosity about these landscapes. And, and so as managers, we need to recognize that just because the situation is sad or people have grief uh, over a fire event, that doesn't mean that, that people aren't interested in, in experiencing that landscape in person. So don't let the presence of grief um, make you think that people don't want to go there. 
Um, when we're thinking about management actions for visitors, uh, as we said, the top of the talk here, access to burned areas can really promote individual healing uh, through through viewing forest recovery. So that's a helpful thing to do. Providing volunteer and planning opportunities is helpful. Even if you can't reopen the whole area, if you can just reopen uh, one or two sites that are especially popular, perhaps, that can really help. And then providing frequent updates as, as near real time as you can about what's going on um, and the timeline for reopening, that can help build a shared understanding about recovery. When we're thinking about residents who live around areas, some things you can do is that uh, you can facilitate support for, for post-fire mitigation activities and behaviors uh, by building from the landscape connections that people have um, to the places. You can hold tours uh, to places of importance that are that are important to the community. So even going out for a little bit to just let people begin to see that, that recovery that's happening can be helpful. Uh, you can also identify the most important landscape elements and places and prioritize those in post-fire restoration. Now, this is an activity you could do uh, after wildfire, but ideally uh, we might do this before wildfire. And so we would know those places in advance and we can go ahead and start working there quickly. But, but if you haven't done that, you can also uh, do that post-fire. In the realm of planning and, and prioritizing, I want to highlight the uh, ENEAT Ranger District work uh, in, in trying to prioritize uh, places for investment in the landscape. And the goal of this project was to identify recreation priorities in this recognized wildfire dependent landscape. And the ENEAT Ranger District had uh, experienced two um, high severity fires in short sequence. And John will talk more about that. In the course of this effort, uh, this combined both field evaluation of looking at trails and, and taking measurements and identifying the amount of investment we would need in these places, and also involved uh, gathering social science data, interviews, public meetings, and online surveys to learn about the perspective of, of residents, visitors, and, and businesses and community groups. The, the ENEAT uh, Recreation Priorities project was created or was done in the lens of sustainable recreation and thinking about sustainable recreation, both uh, are all in fiscally sustainable ways, whether or not the landscape was resilient, the recreation resources were resilient, thinking about ecological sustainability and thinking about social sustainability. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to John. Great. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, a lot of that uh, research and we heard from Eric is, is resonates in, in, in the practical world. Um, you know, people want to return and recreate to their public lands, regardless of the condition, you know, whether they're green or, or black or, you know, burned or somewhere in between that in the, in the recovery stage. Um, they want to, they want to come back and, and visit and recreate on their, on their public land. So some of that is, you know, the casual visitors that may or may not have been to that um, place before. Uh, like Eric said, that they want to be curious about what the fire looks like maybe. But a lot of those are, are visitors that have a tie to that, to that landscape. They have a, a deep, you know, connection with that and they have a deep sense of place for that, that area from, from years of, of use pre-fire. And so they are, they're going to want to get, you know, in there and, and use that um, space um, regardless of, of the condition. So um, folks I've, I've met them, you know, working at ENEAT, you know, they're folks that are just local folks that you know, go out there and they just drive around, look, look for wildlife and, you know, use the time to get, get out of the city. But that's their place to go there all the time. And uh, pre-fire, post-fire, they're gonna go there. Uh, families, like Eric mentioned, you know, families that, um, camp and dispersed sites or at campgrounds, you know, I've met folks that are, you know, have three generations of, of folks camping in, in one one space now, right? There's they've been going there for 20, 30 plus years. And now there's three generations of folks that really have a, you know, a, a tie to, to not just camping, but that, that space where they, they, they do that, that activity. Um, that's, that's where they go. That's where they want to go, regardless, you know, this, of its condition. 
Um, the trails are another, you know, good example. You know, you, trails that people have hiked, maybe it's their first hike, maybe it's their first backpack, uh, their first, you know, destination, you know, lake or, or peak that they went on, um, a place they, they take their children to, you know, as, as years go by. Those trails have, people have a lot of connection to, to trails and the places associated with those trails um, as well. Um, and these, yeah, they, they, all of these experiences, you know, really tie um, people to that to that place, and, and they're going to want to get there regardless of, of that condition. Um, and the, for the management side, we need to recognize that um, uh, need and um, make sure that we provide the for, keep providing those those opportunities for people to to go regardless of um, the, the the condition. Uh, whether it's you know after the fire, so um, already changed. So thanks for changing that. Um, there's a there's a risk there, um, you know, for managers from a safety side. You're taking you know you take on some liability if, when you open a an air park area to to visitors. Um, but I think in every ranger every district ranger or field manager who's, who's ultimately kind of responsible for that will have a different level of risk they're willing to take on. So I think throughout the uh, throughout the public lands, you might you might see different, you know, management styles or or levels of risk and that might impact what is what is open and and, and, and when. Um, the most common you know reaction you know straight away is to you know implement a closure of, of sign some kind. And I mean we've we've seen the impacts, you know, Eric talked about those those impacts really well. And it's not that I, I don't agree with those impacts. I think they, or those closures, sorry. They have a, they have a place in the management um, uh, realm. What, what's hard is when, when you don't have a, a plan post-closure, right? If, if closure is your, your, your only uh, thought and it's like close it, walk away, that's, that's not something we can really, um, I don't feel like we, we're being responsible land managers um, in that scenario, right? We need to think about, um, Post post closure, right? How are we going to manage these lands to provide a, a safe experience or as safe as as, as can be? Because um, as like Eric mentioned again, you know the uh, visitation uh, is only going is has increased on public lands. Um, visitors will keep coming to, to the public lands regardless of you know whether they're burnt or or not, and if. if we close an area, then that use just shifts to somewhere else and potentially, you know, crowds or, or causes impacts on a, another area where, where people are going to go and you're just putting more people in, in you know, smaller space, right? Um, so when looking at management, managing these these areas, um, it really is just like any, you know, bigger complex problem. It helps us break it down into, you know, short-term, long-term uh, possible solutions. Um, some of the short short range uh, needs that, that you have uh, are, are, are pretty common, right? That are pretty known that managing hazard trees or replacing culverts or holding putting up signs, you know, as, as a management tool to decrease your, your liability. But one thing I think that's not thought about enough is, is how you communicate that with, with your publics and your visitors. So uh, if you're gonna close an area that really needs to be, you know, communicated out well. You know, how long that closure is going to be? Uh, you know, what are the plans? You know, to, to reopen that site. That, that opening that communication link, you know, with the, especially the local residents, um, those, those people with that that long term tie to the landscape, um, and also, you know, the visitors that you know may come, you know, not as often. That needs to be uh, really thought about and really, you know, uh, uh, you know, something you do purposefully is communicating that that effort you're doing to not only uh, maintain but re you know, help open those sites um, back up so um, the other thing that's I think is important is to, to really evaluate the, um, that risk so we look at um, sites and, and sometimes we think about closing sites you know, because of a uh, uh, infrequent or a low probability event 
that has a, a high impact, high impact, right, or, or a bad outcome. Um, but it's a it's a pretty low low probability. So really diving deep into that discussion with with uh, scientists and uh, everybody involved to figure out what the risks actually are 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 really uh, important as well because um, if you have a low probability of, of something happening, it, it might be worth taking the risk of, of opening that place back up. Um, and then again, sh you know, shifting some of that responsibility to the user, communicating that, you know, to the user, and you know, informing them of, of what that change landscape is and, and what they are getting, you know, into there with that changed environment. Eric mentioned this INIAT sustainable recreation strategy. I think that is sort of that next uh, phase in that um, transition. So from the from the short term, you know, sort of reactions, uh, it help really helps to have a, a long term plan or strategy that you can fall back on and, and guiding document to help you uh, figure out what you're going to do, you know, down the line. Uh, we we're really fortunate here to have Eric and uh, other folks work on this. Um, strategy for us and we're with us at the district and um, like you said the, the, the work that was done communicating and involving uh, you know businesses the, the local users um, uh, all the visitors on, on the landscape was really put up uh, and then the, all the ground, ground truthing that, that was done put together a really well uh, informed document that um, you know was it has helped the district sort of prioritize uh, what the needs are, what where the work is going to go. And the other thing it did is, is it also you know got buy-in from from uh, those groups that you get help from. So we got a ton of help from uh, other visit uh, you know groups and, and volunteers that helped um, put things together like the bridge you saw um, previously and um, all kinds of trail work and log out and other projects. You know, you can use that the fire and and I guess the impacts uh, as as a motivation to, to gain and you know, get that interest from local folks and other other people to help you uh, restore the, the landscape. So because you're you're never going to be able to do it uh, on your own with just the, the standard staff. You know, it's just and, and and again, folks have that connection to that land and they want to help. They want to be part of that recovery. And um, as was mentioned, I think that really does also tie into that that um, grief uh, subject where if you, if you if you allow people to go out there and experience the, the space they're they're used to going in, I think it helps uh, with that grief recovery there because they're they're there. It might look different, feel different, but they are in that that same place where they had all those prior prior experiences and. Um, you know why? Why is it important for managers to uh, go ahead, Eric? Next one, to um, you know do this kind of work. Well, sometimes you got to put up with a bunch of fire burned trees and, and dead areas to get to places like this um, that you see on the on the screen. So not every place is, is burnt. Sometimes you have to manage that. You know, that other landscapes that people can still enjoy landscapes like this, right? Um, and you know, as managers, it's, it's our responsibility to manage that land. It's public land. It's a public space, and it's for uh, the, the users and, and the public. So, uh, closing it's not really, really a, a, a good long-term option. You know, in my opinion, it's our responsibility to manage that as best we can to provide that um, space and provide that opportunity, those opportunities for people to to, to recreate. Um, it's also you know important to communicate those risks. Like I said. Uh, to, to folks as they as they may enter a different uh, looking space that they're not they're not used to and um, make sure they know what they're you know, getting into. Um, and these areas that are, that are, are burnt and certainly ones that are not, you know, they mean a lot um, to, to places that, that that sense of place that I talked about is, is very strong with with a lot of groups and they're they just they don't want to go to another space, you know, they that may look similar or be next door. They, they don't have that connection, right? They just, just, just that space is what they're used to, it's what they have, they're tied to, and that's that's where they want to go. So we need to work directly with those folks to try to figure out a way to uh, have them get those experiences again. So um, with that, I think uh, now we're turning over uh, to Autumn. 
Great, thanks so much, um, both Eric and John, for your presentations today. I'm going to keep my camera off because um, I don't trust my internet today, and hopefully we won't have any more freeze ups. So <laughs> I'll just I'll just be here with my audio on. Um, but just a reminder, I did drop the survey link as well in there. So if you need to leave before the end of the Q and A, please click on that. Um, and so Eric, there was two questions in the chat for you, and they were towards the beginning of your presentation. I think just a little bit about terminology. Um, so the first one is from Jimmy and they said for recreation motivations, what defines the difference between getting exercise and keeping physically fit? It's an excellent question. I didn't write that survey <laughs> and I had the same question. So the physical activity council, uh, does that, uh, had that survey, uh, set as part of their question set. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I also think they're very close to each other. Um, uh, conceptually, probably keeping physically fit is is more about a, a frequent routine. So maybe those are people who are uh, returning to the same place over and over again as part of their exercise regimen might be my only my only uh, conjecture about what the difference is. That makes sense. Okay, we'll have to look, look into that more and ask those folks in the survey to clarify themselves. <laughs> Uh, and so the second one is from Estefania, and they ask, does recreation include things like land tending or volunteer stewardship? Uh, this may be one of the most frequent questions I got. I get uh, is, you know, does this particular thing count as recreation? <laughs> and my answer back to them usually is, uh, do you feel like you're recreating? If so, then yes. Um, uh, I think those activities that are listed can certainly be um be recreation and, and thinking about uh, a recreation experience uh, in in the woods or in the forest or in the range. And and if people feel like that's recreation, then then that's great. Uh, those specific activities are are not um, not on our list of recreation activities that we use, say, in the Forest Service uh, on our stock list. But that that by no means uh, indicates that that isn't recreation. Okay, thank you. And just a reminder to anybody attending, um, you're welcome to drop any questions you have in the Q&A box or the chat, we'll find them either place. So um, in the meantime, um, I have a couple questions that um, I'll use here to that I had from this. So um, the published report that you posted towards the end, Eric, on your presentation, the Antiat Sustainable Recreation Strategy, um, what, what would you do differently or the same after having gone through that process? Um, I'll, I'll let John provide his his thoughts, but I'll I'll first just say that um, that work was was done largely by uh, Western Washington University and and Kate Galambos, who I think is on the on the meeting here today, and then uh, Tammy Leninga, and they did um, fantastic work and a tremendous number of hours out in the field, uh, collecting data on the trail and tremendous amount of energy uh, and effort to collect. Uh, social science data from people interested in the ENIAT. And, and so I'll just highlight that that was great work that the Forest Service did in partnership with the university. And, and I don't think that we would have been able to do that work without without them as as partners. Um, I, I've, I'll let John say what he thinks maybe um, we might do differently. I think maybe one thing I might do differently is, is if we could go back in time, we would do it sooner. Uh, that's probably a pretty common notion though so john yeah sure would have been good but um yeah funding came from grant cycle so we were kind of hinged on that so i think the one thing i would might do differently is or two things is um internally you know forest service wise i think it was uh, it was a great effort i'm not sure how what i what I would do is is, be able, is try to pass that the, the information along to other major districts and forests and, and inform them about the effort and how to do it if, if there was a need on their end. I don't think I did a very good job of you know touting the work that that was Western Washington and Eric did and the product that that was provided to the district and then uh, giving it as an example to other areas that you know this is you know, if you've got this situation this is something you might you know want to think about doing. This is pretty beneficial. And um, the other thing was maybe involving 
management a little more like upper levels like uh you know for supervisor and maybe even regional office folks and, and getting them you know not necessarily buy-in but at least informing them that, of what we were doing because you know everybody kind of lives in their own little world and it's really busy and can't track everything that's going on so kind of pushing that into into different uh people's laps a little bit more because it was a really great uh you know great effort and, and really good products so. thanks eric and john um okay uh, another question. So we're like a science exchange. So this is a question I have for almost everybody all the time. Um, <laughs> but the question, um, and I'm going to, there's kind of two questions in here. So I'll put them together and you can answer, you know, whatever comes to you. Uh, the first part of the question is, you know, how can managers and scientists work together in post-fire recovery for recreation? And then the flip side of that is like, what are some key research areas um, for future research need of that? Want me to go first here? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think, you know, just um, sometimes the, you know, the research branch uh, is, is a little bit separate, you know, from the NFS side. And like I said, poor, you know, Forest Service folks are, are kind of strapped, you know, every second of their day is usually pretty, pretty taken up. So it's, sometimes it's hard for us on the NF side when I was there to sort of think about our opportunities. I was lucky that I had a relationship with with Eric before and knew, you know, what he was and what he did and was able to tap into that without that, you know, prior experience or prior relationship. I'm not sure any of this, you know, the recreation strategy would have happened. So, you know, making sure, you know, first of all, that, that awareness uh, at the, you know, the district level or the NFS level uh, that the research branch is there and can, and can help and can support and do this kind of work is, is uh, I think, a big one. Um, and then, yeah, I think I'll let Eric take from there. Yeah, those, those are good uh, ways about manager science partnership. I I would add that I I think um, you know social scientists in the Forest Service can can help managers um, oftentimes place in context what they're seeing on the ground, and and that that can I think be helpful. Um, social scientists can also help. Um, relay what, what the science says about the management uh, event that's happening on the ground. Uh, and, I, and I think that can be helpful to managers because frankly, uh, we're all busy, but but managers, um, you know, it's really, they can't keep up on the science perhaps as well as a scientist might and, and we can help them uh, work through that. Uh, I think science, social scientists in my particular case, you know, if someone came to me, I think another thing I can do is help connect you to other scientists within our research station that may be able to answer questions about, um, you know, hyd um, hydrological conditions or something. If, if that's helpful, uh, post fire, or or other other questions that you may have. So that's that's another way that science uh, can help with managers. I think is just to make connections, and the imp can't overstate the importance of these uh, personal relationships and in, in helping get this work done. For research needs, I, I we need simply more studies uh, in post-fire landscapes uh, to look at recreation response. There, there really is just a handful of them, um, so we need more of those. A big question on my mind is also what are the cumulative effects of many fires across the landscape? So the studies that that are out there are looking at one fire and what happened in recreation in that one landscape. I have a lot of questions about what is happening across uh, large landscape areas that are that are receiving multiple fires um, in in short uh, time sequence and and how does that affect recreation so that that's a key area that i think we need need more research in great thank you both for those answers um, we have a question in the chat from rachel um, and they say portland monthly published an article called why you should visit wildfire burned forests this summer, um, citing reasons like potential to see wildlife, tons of wildflower flowers, et cetera. And then the question is, is there any concern that too many people will visit potentially damaging fragile recovering ecosystems? I think, I think yes, you know, I think Eric showed a sign there on his presentation that, you know, encouraged folks to, to stay on, on trails 
Um, the other concern, you know, with a bunch of visitors is now you've got from management side is now you've got, you know, just more people that, you know, potentially could get, get hurt or, you know, get hit by a tree or, you know, something like this. So, um, yeah, I think that it, again, it goes back to that, that good communication with, with your publics and your visitors and, and educating them, you know, you have to ramp up your education effort. Uh, I think and that's, you know, signs on the ground that's you know, using social media, but, you know, um, really reaching out and, and educating folks to, about not only there is a great opportunity there, like, you know, was, was mentioned, but it comes with some maybe some other uh, considerations uh, for, for the landscape of staying on the trail and doing a few other things. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, there's one in the chat for Michelle. And they ask, how does fire impact on visitation vary among social groups? So for example, old timers to the area versus urban ethnicity, socioeconomic class. Um, and are there some groups whose visitation is particularly impacted by fires? Sorry, thanks, Michelle. Uh there, there needs to be more research on this area, particularly looking at, um, large, at groups that are particularly underrepresented or historically underrepresented and marginalized. I, th I think the groups that are likely most affected are those whose recreation is very place-based. And so for instance, those doing subsistence activities or foraging, um, that's not a, that's, that's something that's difficult to transition to a new landscape. Uh, or if that landscape is closed, you know, they're not able to do that. So I, that's a group that I, those activities that are very place-based, I think those are the groups that are most likely to, to, um, to suffer the most. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. We're coming to the end of the hour here and uh, thank you, especially to Eric and John for your presentation today and um, imparting what we know about recreation after fires and